Right before World War II, Soviet engineers developed the T-34 medium tank. This highly versatile, easy-to-produce vehicle arrived just in time and was instrumental in the eventual victory against German forces. A few more years passed and there was another engineering triumph when the team, led by Alexander Morozov, created the T-54, a medium tank with massive potential for modernization. But no vehicle can serve forever. Despite all the strengths of the tanks of the T-54 family, in the 1950s, Soviet engineers started to work on their eventual replacements. The first successor was accepted into service in 1964 as the T-64. The new tank designed by the Kharkiv Design Bureau was a state-of-the-art affair. It was well protected against heat and sub-caliber projectiles thanks to its composite armor and the incorporation of an autoloader which allowed the crew to be reduced to three. On top of that, the vehicle was fitted with a 5TDF, a new, compact and powerful engine which looked extremely promising. Soon after that, the tank was accepted into service, though it proved to be rather capricious and hard to maintain. Not only that, even though the new engine did perform really well, it was only made in Kharkiv. While tanks of the previous generation were produced in the thousands, the Kharkiv Design Bureau could only make hundreds of T-64s at best. The T-64 wasn't the only option available to the Soviets at the time. There was also a competing design for a new main tank made by a team at Uralvagonzavod, a machine-building company located in Nizhny Tagil. When the flaws of Kharkiv tank became evident, the team at Nizhny Tagil was finally given a green light to work on their own version. The initial plan was simply to equip the reliable T-62 with an automated loading system. The idea was quickly scrapped as Soviet decision-makers considered the T-62, as well as its 115mm gun, things of the past. The team in Nizhny Tagil changed their approach and started working on an improved model of the T-64, soon leading to a prototype known as Object 172. The finicky 5TDF was replaced with the V45 diesel engine, which was considerably easier to produce a move that the top brass were very happy with, and there were some changes made to the running gear of the vehicle as well. Engineers also equipped the tank with an improved auto-loading system where ammunition was stored horizontally with the aim of making it safer and more reliable. Ultimately, by 1973, the vehicle was ready for production as a cheaper, more reliable alternative to the T-64, even though originally it was only to be serially produced in the event of a war, soon the military changed their collective minds and the tank was finally fully accepted into service as the T-72. Soviet generals were quick to recognize the potential of the new tank and the team behind the project began developing its improved variants as well as versions meant for export. Soon, the T-72 was the main tank of the countries in the socialist bloc. It's worth noting that as a general rule, export versions of this vehicle were somewhat less formidable than the tanks produced for internal use. In 1979, the Soviet Union introduced a new version of the tank known as the T-72A. The vehicle was given new equipment including an improved FCS, two-level rubber panels protecting the upper part of the suspension and upper hull, and better armor overall. In December 1984, many Soviet armored corps were already receiving another variation, the T-72B. This model was equipped with a new, more powerful engine, the V-84, and the Svir ATGM. Moreover, from 1989 onwards, the T-72Bs were also given the Contact 5 era, 
just like the tanks of the T-80 series. Compared to the previous generations of the Soviet era, the Contact 5 protected the vehicle from both heat and sub-caliber projectiles. By that time, the T-72 already made quite a name for itself all around the world. The USSR produced tens of thousands of these tanks, and some of them saw action in the Iran-Iraq War, as well as in Lebanon and Ethiopia. At some point in time, it was also discovered that modern Israeli rounds fired from a 105mm L7 gun could penetrate the frontal defenses of the T-72. In response to that, a better protected variation of the T-72A was introduced, featuring, among other improvements, an additional 16mm applique armor added to the Glacy. On the other hand, the area around the driver's port was still a weak point, even on the upgraded model. So there was that. As the collapse of the Soviet Union drew near, engineers in Nizhny Tagil were busy developing a new line of upgrades for the T-72. One of the prototypes they made was equipped with a new engine, a modern fire control system, and the Stora, an electro-optical jammer that protects tanks from AT guided missiles. This tank was accepted into service in the newly founded Russian Federation as the T-90. In War Thunder, we have its upgraded variant, the T-90A, with a 1,000 horsepower diesel engine and a new welded turret. As the T-72, with a myriad of its derivatives, is still the workhorse of the Russian Armoured Corps, it's hardly surprising that, from 2012 onwards, there's been an ongoing effort to upgrade older models to the standard of the T-72B3 variant. War Thunder features one of the latest models of this line with modern thermal sights and the Relict ERA. Furthermore, there is also a Syrian variant of the T-72AV, available as a premium vehicle. It is fitted with a brand new fire control system made by Officini Galileo, an Italian company that is known for working on the C1 Ariete. The tank features panoramic sights for the commander and second generation thermal sights for both commander and gunner, making the T-72AV an effective combatant at any time of the day. The T-72 has been in service for so long that its operators know the tank inside and out, with all its strengths and flaws. This is a vehicle that stood the trial of time and was tested in countless battles. It's reliable and easy to maintain, but it also has its own peculiar traits, like the fact that it's very tightly packed. Different variations of this tank are currently in service in Russia, Poland, India and many other countries. The T-72 is also frequently seen in military parades. Have you ever seen it with your own eyes? Please tell us in the comments below. We love to hear from you because it's you who provide us with the ammunition to make our series great.